All right, I think we're slowly finding our way to the door. Um, so it's now time for public comment. Um, please make sure you've signed in with your name and address at the back of the room before you come forward to the podium to speak. Public comment is three minutes per person, which uh, will be uh, timed by the timer on the wall there that makes a fairly lar loud noise at the end of the three minute process. Um, Jonathan is acting as board secretary, so if there's a malfunction on the clock, you can blame him. Okay. <laughs> and also, I request that you please be patient with me as I'm recording names and, and such as you get up and speak. So uh, if I pause you, please forgive me. I've got a few extra jobs this evening. <laughs> Um, if your comment does pertain to an action item, which is one that appears later on on the agenda, we would ask that you wait until that item comes up for discussion to make your comment. You will be allowed time to comment after the board discusses the item, but before the board votes on the item. Comments related to disciplinary actions or other matters, which could be the subject of a grievance process, um, or comments that are derogatory of a person, business, or organization, will be ruled out of order. Um, there are public comment forms at the back table um, that you may fill out in lieu of coming forward and speaking if you so desire. Um, and if you would like to make any public comment right now at this time, please feel free to step forward and slowly state your name and address for Jonathan. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Sarah Rivera. I'm sure some of you have inwardly rolled your eyes at the thought, great, there's those moms again. When will they just let it go? The answer is never, we can't. You see, what you may not know is that we have been fighting for our kids their whole lives. It may not have been like this, speaking publicly at a school board meeting, but it has been always combating the same mentality that our kids aren't as worthy as typical developing kids. You may not think that you have this mentality, but have you ever said, we have to do what's best for all the kids, not just yours. Well, our kids are part and an equal part of all. What about, that's not fair to the other kids. We don't ask for it to be fair, but we do fight for it to be equitable. We fight for our kids to be seen as equally as important as their peers. It can be soul crushing to be told time and again, a hundred different ways, your children aren't worth even the smallest of accommodation. So we will fight. We fight for policy changes that should be standard practice already because recording benefits everyone in a meeting. We fight for stronger policies to protect our children and teachers from seclusion and restraint practices that are traumatic and unsafe for both. They are worth the effort to find a better way. We fight for our kids to be offered the same considerations that their general education peers are afforded when it comes to redistricting. Instead of their classrooms and programs being shifted around every year from building to building like an inconvenient afterthought. And when you have 30 years to comply with the federal law requiring you to, take, to make all schools accessible to those with disabilities and it's not done, only to have ADA language show up in a bond issue as if it were an extra that it only will happen if people vote for it makes all of us with differently able students again feel like our children ha are just pawns in your plan. They aren't a priority their well-being being held hostage by whether or not this bond passes, or at least that's how it appears. My son's teachers and school staff are amazing. They treat him with love and the respect that he deserves. So is the problem only at the top? I am an optimist by nature. I like to believe that no one does any of these things with malicious intent, but by simply not understanding these types of challenges. But when you represent a school district serving people of many different backgrounds, challenges, and concerns, you do not have the luxury of claiming ignorance. It is your job to find out those things you do not understand, ask for help when and where you need it, and if people from a marginalized group continually show up month after month after month, you might want to consider that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. Please remember that our children are different, but they are not less. They are not less. Good evening, Robin Schultz. Okay. 
Um, as you know, legislation to require schools to allow parents to record IEP and 504 plan meetings was filed in December. Some of us representing MODE, Missouri Disability Empowerment, spent time over Christmas break preparing for the legislative session. One way we like to prepare is to make sure we are ready for any question that might be asked. We decided to take the questions asked by the board at the September board meeting and come up with answers to them, since legislators in other school districts will have the same questions that you had. We looked at the minutes from the board meeting to find out the questions you asked, but it didn't have them, so we listened to the recording. We then worked through the questions you asked that would be applicable to all school districts. We have compiled a four-page document which addresses these questions and will be given to legislators. It's also located on our website. We want this accessible to any school district. To put this information together, we sat down with a team which consisted of two IT experts, a teacher, a speech language pathologist who once worked in schools, a few moms of children with IEPs, and a former special education administrator. We knew that to have the best information, we needed to bring together a team with different perspectives and ideas. The first page gives a little background information. It points out that schools should already have equipment and policies in place for those who use recording as an ADA accommodation. Teachers should already be comfortable and trained on recording, since some families can do this. The second page goes into what it would cost if a school decided to also record. I know that was a big concern. Um, I want to point out, I won't go into all the numbers, but I want to point out that G Suites for Education is a free program CPS and many schools use, and it has unlimited data storage. G Suites for Education is FERPA compliant. We also included the cost for other data storage options. And I know that CPS might have their own method, and that's great if that seems to be as expensive as I know was quoted a few months ago. It might be worth looking into some of these other options. The last page discusses a possible procedure for recording. It addresses questions like, how will we know who is talking? And what about ADA accommodations? Those were asked in September. An open recording policy and straightforward procedures would make life less complicated for parents and teachers. It would also eliminate the problem of parents and students being refused the ability to record, even though they need to record as an ADA accommodation. We are almost 10 months into the process of asking for an open recording policy. Are the parents frustrated? Of course they are. A work group was formed in September, and we still are waiting back to hear from them. We are still waiting on a timeline. We are still waiting on a vote. This has gone on long enough. Please vote in either February or March on the recording issue. This gives your IT team time to get things in place if you vote in favor of changing your policy for the next school year. Don't drag this out and pass this issue on to the new board members. This issue belongs to this board and needs to be decided by this board promptly. Thanks. My name is Kara Arnett. As many of you know, I have a child with an educational disability who attends a district-wide classroom. He is in fifth grade and we are not yet aware of which building he will be transitioning to in middle schools. We have not yet had that transition IEP meeting. However, I have been made aware by several friends that a letter was sent out and that there are many district-wide classrooms moving to different buildings next year. Also recently in the news, I have seen that there's an ele elementary redistricting coming down the pipeline. And of course, we just went through secondary redistricting as well. When students are moved around the district at these times, there are task forces made, parent input meetings held, and timelines made to determine that the greatest amount of students benefit in the best way, or at least that's the hope of the groups. There seems to be an inequity between how the location of students in regular education classrooms is determined compared to those in special education. In 2017, we built our house, our new house in, our, in my son's current elementary district. We did this so my son could live in the community he goes to school with, so that my daughter could go to school with her brother and not be forced to attend a different neighborhood school, and so that we could have a community. And we, along with his teachers, have worked very hard to build that community in his current school. I knew that next year he would likely be attending a middle school outside of this community. I didn't love it, but was dealing with it. Now that I've learned a conscious decision was made to move this potential landing spot, I'm greatly disappointed that it's not within the same progression of buildings as his peers. For instance, he will likely attend Battle Elementary, Gentry Middle School, and then Battle High School. But I guess that's really only if the programs continue to be housed in those buildings they currently are. 
It would make only too much sense to house these programs in buildings that progress together so they can grow relationships and friends. So now my son will likely attend a new school year with zero familiar peers. Zero. Even his, in his classroom of peers, he has been with an elementary. Most, if not all, have been shipped off to high roads, and he's the only current fifth grader in his classroom. He will have zero familiar faces next year. For students like my son, at best they are moved from one building to the next with little forethought for their long-term future or peer interactions. At worst, they are moved from building to building at the behest of the administration in those buildings who are ready to move them down the road. That's an actual thing a former employee of the district has told me. I can only hope this is grossly exaggerated and untrue. A recent letter that was mailed out stated how great the move was for the new building because it would offer laundry services for the students to learn life skills. Well, I can tell you my family found it. A, my grandfather opened an appliance business in 1959. My dad still operates it to this day. We can move laundry services. We can't move their friends. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Sean Rivera. I am a certified information system security practitioner, and I've worked in the information technology industry for over 20 years of my life. Uh, I do have a child who is uh, in the CPS school district, uh, and he also has special needs. <clears throat> I'd like to speak to the uh, numbers that were put together in response to an inquiry around the cost uh, projected to maintain audio recordings of IEPs. Uh, seeing the number of approximately $700,000 was rather shocking, uh, and I was not sure exactly how that number was, was uh, derived. Over the past decade, data storage has become cheaper and cheaper by the gigabyte. And by most estimates, the cost of such storage uh, is usually tenths of a penny per gigabyte. Given the high adoption of cloud storage, it's probably even lower. Uh, additionally, public education has afforded various perks and benefits due to uh, the in industry sector, which would see great discounts supplied. Uh, there's even some services that are provided by Google that would actually be free uh, to the education sector, which would allow for unlimited storage and uh, would definitely meet the needs for uh, FERPA certified data storage. Um, I do believe that that most um, teachers and educators are provided a, a laptop of some type, I believe, um, that would be able to be used to record such recordings as what we're talking about. Uh, when viewing this through the lens of an information security practitioner, I do understand that there's concern about maybe there's uh, sensitive data and information left on a, a hard drive, what happens if that laptop gets lost, so on and so forth. And certainly there's uh, pr precautions you can take to help mitigate that further such as disk level encryption, um, authentication uh, as well, Active Directory based authentication, and policy that would indeed um, enforce uh, the lack of storage on a uh, local disk drive. I see all this come to this conclusion that collecting and storing audio files for IMPs is not a hard task to figure out or overcome. It doesn't have to cost a penny, really. and with well-written procedures, it shouldn't add but an additional minute or two to most, um, to most to store this data within CPS-owned and operated technology infrastructure. Lastly, this should not be a barrier to instituting a simple IEP recording policy. Thank you. My name is Amy Saladay. I wanted to follow up on the work group regarding the recording policy. First of all, thank you for forming the work group. I appreciate it. I think all the other members of Como Septa and Mo do as well. Mrs. Maliti, you said at the September board meeting you wanted the work group to address teacher concerns. How is that being done? Scripts and checklists were discussed in your first work group meeting, and they most certainly raised the issue of predetermination, which is illegal. There has to be another way to make teachers feel comfortable other than scripts and checklists. Why isn't the work group setting up calls with districts in other states who already record to see how they handle recording? 
Might that be a way for <coughs> teachers to feel more comfortable with recording? Ms. Wade, you asked at the September board meeting, what else can be done to help parent participation? How is the work group addressing that question? Mr. Sessions, you asked in the work group, is this a first step towards a CPAC? What is being done to follow up with that? Mr. Sessions, you also asked how to make parents feel supported. What is the work group doing to address that question? Mr. Willoughby, you said that the first goal should be getting ADA procedures put into place. It's been four months. Those disabilities haven't gone away and neither have the parents. Do your new ADA guidelines make parents feel uncomfortable or do they feel supported? With your work group, why aren't we accepting names from everyone who wants to participate? You had a redistricting boundary line work group that accepted anyone who wanted to participate. Why is your recording work group being handled differently? Why doesn't your work group have more than one parent? Why doesn't your work group have a high school student with an IEP or a 504 plan? When they're 18, they have to run their own meetings. You should have a student be part of that work group. Why are there no representatives from Race Matters or from Faith Voices? Is there equity in your work group? Are all classes represented? Why isn't there anyone on your work group outside of CPS who has experience with data storage? Why aren't there updates? Why are the documents not being publicly shared? What are the goals? Why haven't these been made public? Where is the agenda? Did you intend for your work group to meet only one time since the September board meeting? You formed a work group. That's great. Now let's get down to business. Let's make sure it's equitable. And let's make sure that that work group is really doing the job that you as a board intended. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia Olmsted, and I am also here to talk about the recording policy. Um, so last week I was scheduled to have an IEP meeting. It had been scheduled for several months, um, and I had requested to record the meeting um, as that is an accommodation in my IEP and necessary because I am not able to take notes as quickly as the discussion goes. Um, I had to do so also on behalf of my mom because um, my district uh, school email was deactivated um, so I could not communicate with um, school officials. Um, and as a result of my request to record, the meeting was abruptly canceled. Um, and apparently the reason that that was done was because I did not submit a request form um, I was never made aware of such policy, nor was I given a copy of the form, um, and certainly not in an accessible format. Um, and you may be wondering, you know, can we just like reschedule or, or something? Um, it is of the essence that this IEP happen immediately and ASAP because I need to go to a program at Missouri School for the Blind. Um, I will learn skills there that I needed to have learned um, at Rockbridge that I could not get. Um, also, I have had a lot of trauma from being at Rockbridge because of issues I have encountered, not necessarily, I mean some, but not necessarily from like building staff, but primarily because of district-wide policies and um, I mean, it, it's gotten so bad to where I am having to graduate early. 
I also had to go to the emergency room once because my symptoms were so bad that my doctor was afraid I would have a heart attack. Um, the first attempt um, at having a meeting, which turned into a meeting about why the meeting was canceled, was very traumatic. It was challenging to go back into that building and I simply cannot handle another one. So with that in mind, my advice for the district is to examine laws such as the uh, ADA and IDEA, uh, as well as federal and state law. Um, and I would ask that you please ensure that your policy aligns with those laws and um, that you um, just make sure that you are treating all special ed students with the dignity and respect that they deserve because we are just like any other student. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing a solution put forth soon. Hello, I'm Laura Wakefield, 2507 St. Regis Court. I also wanted to give an update related to policy KKB and give you kind of a snapshot of five clients that I have that have requested the accommodations that they should have under ADA. They are all parents who have disabilities. Um, and there are five families that have done that. Two of the parents are white, three are black. The two parents that are white um, were given blanket okay, yes you can. They didn't have to fill out a form. They don't have to request before every meeting. All is well. The three black parents all were told no on the initial. They were told they had to fill out a form and even when they filled out a form they were given pushback and they had to fight for it. One parent had to file an Office of Civil Rights complaint over it. So I wanted to give you an update that the, whatever the procedures that are being developed right now, they definitely are not equitable. So that would be really important for you to look into. Thank you. I don't see anybody else rising. Is there anybody else who would like to rise and just hasn't done so yet? Doesn't appear to be the case. Well, that will conclude that portion of public comment and we will move on to the report of the board president.